It's a thrill to have our next guest on this On The Mark podcast. And you can go and see it on YouTube. Just search Mark and Woman Golf or on my website, markandwoman.com. It's Darren May. Somehow he's not on tour this week. I don't know. Uh, someone kidnapped you. Uh, why aren't you on the PGA Tour this week, Darren? I don't go out as much as uh, I don't go out as much as I used to. I've got a lot going on at the club with a lot of other projects that we've got going on. So it's nice to be a little bit more diverse. It's um, as you know, it's uh, it's one. It's very special being out there and spending that time with the guys on the range. But it's always nice to be able to branch off into some other things of interest as well. No kidding. Well, speaking of things of interest, I want to introduce you to our global audience first. Uh, actually, no. Secondly, first, I want people to tell you about where you get to work because I've seen pictures of this place. I've heard conversations from some of the guys. I mean, the Grove, the, the place is mind-numbing. So tell us a little bit about where you work, please. Yeah. So um, I met Michael. I, I previously worked at the Bears Club for 10 years and I met Michael at the Bears Club. And Michael, um, Jordan. When, yeah. Michael Jordan, yeah. Right. And um, when he had the idea of pursuing his dream of building his own facility, he asked me whether I had any ideas of um, a practice facility. And, and I, I had a few from having the pleasure of working with some of the guys on tour already. And um, he allowed me to kind of put those, those ideas forwards to him and he kind of went for it. So um, it was a, it was a huge opportunity for me to to be able to do that, and it was a, a privilege to do it for Michael. But the the main thing, Mark, is is that um, people really like it, enjoy it, see the value of it, and uh, it's been it's been really well received by everyone. So that's the main thing. Well, he has a mantra, and help me if I get it wrong, but it goes something to the effect of. And now, for the folks around the world who aren't familiar with Michael Jordan, prob- arguably the greatest basketball player in the NBA of all time. Um, the mantra was training should be harder than the games, the matches. Yeah. All work is done pre the whistle or the bell going or whatever the case might be. And yeah. so what you guys have put together is basically a place where you can train any element, any facet of the golf in this one practice facility, right? Yeah. There's, we, we built it around obviously statistical data first and foremost, because that's obviously how we measure a lot of, improvement and the small areas of improvement at the highest level but the nice thing about it is is it's it's scalable as well which means that it's useful for any handicap type or any player type so um it just it just really is based on um sizing of targets mark so okay. all the targets are, are able to be moved around there's no cups in the any of the target areas we have these special pins that have got bases that um we can move the we can move the pin location to all these different terraces that are sized either best in the world or different gradients of handicap type. Sensational. We're going to get into how to train like a pro in a minute. One of the things I love, and I was involved with a little venture here at the university where I was for a little while in building a practice facility. And for me, uneven lies were just a must have. Yeah. You guys have a situation there where you can hit off whatever lie you want too, right? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we built a few areas where there was some pet specificity to it based on some of the lie angles that we kind of, we kind of encounter on tour. Um, the amount of measuring devices that we can use now to get those gradients is easy. I mean, you can put an iPhone down now and get slope. So um, we, kind of, we kind of built some slopes in there that were certain distances away from certain targets that simulate a certain kind of shot value. All right. um, but also... And, and I'm sure that you've experienced this, Mark. Hitting balls off of lies can change someone's pattern and someone's trackman numbers pretty pretty easily because it's so easy to get the feel of what the body motion should be doing based on how the gravity of the slope will move you. So it's very advantageous for that for, for that reason. Also. Well, I don't think, and I'm getting ahead of myself as I typically do when I got interesting guests in the show. I don't I, I don't think people practice off uneven situations enough to reshape golf swings if you will like if you someone who tends to come over it real steeply get the ball above your feet or vice versa or appeals downhills to work on angle of attack and your point is so well founded there where someone's grinding away with a launch monitor and they can get on some uneven line start to get the feel for what they're looking for right away yeah yeah and that's i mean that's a big part of what we try and do is is that um i mean when you're working on mechanics obviously there's a science element to it but the quickest and the 
the the path of least resistance is to get that person to feel it as soon as possible. Yeah. So you know we can explain it with 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 cameras and and numbers and force plates and whatever we want to use. But it, if they can't feel that that specific motion, then it's going to be a bit of a struggle. And I'm definitely I'm definitely leaning towards the path of least resistance when we're working with someone. We want someone to pick that up as soon as possible. That's why you're so popular. Okay, um, let's introduce you. He's got a different sounding accent for our American folks. Darren, tell us about you, how you came to, first off, the United States, and then, of course, the Bears Club, and now where you are. Uh, so I first of all came over to the U.S. Um, in 2004. Mm -hmm. um, I'd been coming over to the U.S. previously before that every winter with a company that um, was based uh, in the in the US. It's a, co a company called SST, Shaft Puring Alignment. And there was a company in London that had an affiliation with them. And um, I was really coming over to learn about launch monitors because the interesting thing, Mark, at that point was it was the equipment companies that had launch monitors. It wasn't coaches at that time. So um, I was not really into golf equipment. I was more into learning about, this is fascinating that this thing can measure ball flight and um it, it, it's, it was that time where tiger woods had first came on the scene with high launch low spin and it was one of the elements of wow this guy hits it so far because of that and it was always intriguing that the equipment companies had those so mm. um i came over in 2004 with an opportunity to work with this club fitting company to begin with that would travel up and down the east coast and at that time they had a flight scope one of the really really early flight scopes they were based out of South Africa at the time. And, I had one of those. Um, it was called a Kudu, I believe it was back. Yeah, in the it was earlier than that. It was actually <laughs> earlier than that. It was like the right. big white one. So yeah, okay. um, it was like manual setup. You had to turn all these Allen keys and everything to get it lined up. And um, one of the clubs that we fit golf clubs for was a place called the Bears Club. And another one of the clubs that we fit golf clubs for was a place called Atlantic for Rick Hartman out in Long Island. And um, I got offered a I got offered to teach there when I. Um, work there after working with the membership with golf clubs and using a launch monitor. And I got uh, a teaching job in the Bears Club because of that. And I got a teaching job at Atlantic because of that. And that's kind of where it all started. And then, as you know, from the previous conversation, um, after meeting Michael at the Bears Club, we kind of moved over in 2016 to, to designing the range at Grove 23. So that's, that's kind of how my time started in the US. So it's, I've been very lucky. Well, it's well earned. I mean, you do good stuff. You're one of the great, one of the bright minds in the game, and you're sought out, sought after by many, many a touring pro. Uh, notably, right now, I guess Kev, um, uh, Keegan Bradley, I should say, Kevin Streelman, there are a bunch of guys who work with you, but Keegan, he's just one of those perennial flushes. And I, and I want to tee off the conversation with that. I pitched you, I'm like, join me, Darren. And he's like, sure, I'm available. And I was like, well, thank God, because my schedule's a mess. And, and I was like, I, I want to bring the tour to our listeners around the world. And, and I want to make it about training and practice. Yep. But yeah, as I've watched Keegan grow up through the tour, now under your counsel of late, I've watched him really mature, but the ball striking has never gone away. And the DNA to his golf swing has never really gone away to me either. You know, right. Some of the other little elements have gone. So I just want you to sort of kick it off then and we'll dive into the material, please. Uh, with regards to Keegan? Yeah, just, just Keegan, because I think he's, he's such an awesome case study because Keegan's Keegan, and, and, and I'm yeah. recommending to folks to, you can only be true to yourself. Right. There's certain things you should iron out and tighten up, but you yeah. can't go and try and be somebody else. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. I definitely, I, I've, I've worked with a number of guys, lucky enough to work with a number of guys, and, and what I'm kind of encouraged with myself is that they've, they've all been very, very different with the way that they mm -hmm. swing. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely not, I'm definitely not a method instructor from that principle. Um, I'm I, obviously I use measuring tools like we all do now. Um, I think that's essential used appropriately. Um, with regards to Keegan, um, there were a couple of things that we felt that would make him even more consistent than he already was. Yeah. Um, but I think that the, the, the interesting thing about some of the things that we do, especially specific with regards to practices is that how are you going to make what they're good at even better and and it's there's always a good element to coaching with regards to working on people's weaknesses but don't forget their strengths because that's that's what gets them there that's what their confidence is founded in mm -hmm. and if you can if you can make their strengths even better um there's a there's a there's a huge benefit to that mark in my opinion 
Um, also, from from a training perspective, they really enjoy being tra- being challenged extremely hard at something that they're really good at. So yeah. the mental load that you can apply to them when they're really good at something is um, pretty substantial. And then you have to be you have to be appropriate to that mental load on the things that they're weaker at. It can't be at the same severity. But that's the responsibility of the coach. So um, from Keegan's point of view, um, we tightened a few things up with regards to just a couple of things fundamentally his grip would always tendency would be to get a little bit too strong mm-hmm. um he'd get a little low in posture we see that as the grounds go on in tournaments um and then um from that point onwards is um maintaining consistency of a swing plane number on a track man and that that correlates itself with dynamic posture and not really coming out of okay. early extension mm-hmm. so um we we do a lot of work where his backside staying on a chair stuff like that basic stuff um, and that kind of controls his swing plane. But from that point onwards, it was more about how good he's got at distance control, mm. um, building a matrix with um, yardage work and how good he can hit his numbers. Um, he's become very, very good at that. And as you know, um, distance control is the first prerequisite of reducing proximity to the hole. So um, that was the first key to work on distance control. And then really setting out some tasks based on, um, you know, where he would need to aim with pins on the left and where he would need to aim with pins on the right and, you know, how to go about with wind off the right and how to go about things with wind off the left. So when, when you're dealing with someone that that's good of that, that's that good of a ball striker, you start, you really getting into the, the details of it, but that's where, that's where it's fun. But you see, that's what I appreciate. And that's why I kind of, I didn't know you were going to come with that answer, but this is so perfect because I knew there had to be something because as I've watched him through my years as an announcer, I mean, some of the wiggles before the shot had gone, I can see the posture adjustment because he always used to be, look real crouchy. And then the arm swing would sort of swing up and you'd see him react and tilt back. But now he's holding shape. And I actually had him in the final round um, at the Wells Fargo earlier in the season in 2022. And it wasn't his best day, but you could see how he remained true to what he was doing. But still, if you watch him from when he won the PGA coming out, and where he is now, he's very much the same looking guy. And I love what yeah. you say here, because I feel like it's intellectually lazy for everybody. They, they want to improve and they just start cutting on stuff that doesn't or isn't statistically sound or doesn't seem to be working right. And you like, I love what you say to do improve, to improve what's good, because it gets, gets, everyone gets so wrapped up in what's bad that they almost yeah. lose their identity as players as a result. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean... We've always, I mean, that I think that was some of the, the the things that some of us might have fallen short on when statistical data first came out. Obviously, it was very revealing, and we could we could see where people's deficiencies were, and we all kind of went straight into working on people's deficiencies. And there was a little bit of a shortfall there because we didn't keep up with necessarily what made them great. And you know, my my first intention is to make sure that you maintain what gets them there, what keeps them there, and what what keeps them at the standard that they're at. So that that's a full-time job in itself, quite frankly. Well, I love it. And folks, I want you to listen again. What Darren said there, he talked about hitting in certain wind directions and hitting to certain hole locations, what the strategy and such, because that's a real way that you can shave strokes off the get, off the score. All right, so here we are. So, so we're going to train and practice like a pro. And you've got three elements. I'm going to tee you up, let you go. And then we're going to put the bow on the whole thing but I sort of love this when you sent this to me. I'm like, wow, we could camp here forever. So, so let's so let's get going. Pardon me, let's get going. The first one, MPT or motor pattern training. Um, and you, and I'll tee this off by saying during every practice or training session, you want to consider these three areas of skill. So these are the three areas. First off, the motor pattern training. So describe that and then explain to the listener viewer how they can uh, improve that skill. Yeah, so um, I, I think that there's there's really two areas of skill for playing golf. One of them's hitting the ball. There's a skill of hitting the ball. So there's mm-hmm. the skill of hitting a putt, a chip, a pitch, and that's just making the mechanical um, competence of creating good contact. That's mm-hmm. that's the skill in itself. Unfortunately, that doesn't lend itself to necessarily playing the game. So you've got the ability to uh, the, the skill of learning to hit the ball, and then you've got the skill of playing shots, and those two things are completely different. And I think that in a practice session, you have to consider those two elements because it's, it's certainly my job as a coach to take a player through those two areas 
And the way that we do that is obviously you want to make sure that someone's got mechanical competence or um, getting back to baseline. And you do that in a certain area and use, again, the measuring tools that we use that you have available, um, be it camera or track man or um, force plates or whatever it is. But, you know, there's, there's only a certain amount of time that I'd like to stay there. And then there's no it's a fruitless task trying to be perfect there, Mark, as you know. So um, once it's at a certain tolerance, we're then trying to turn that turn that kind of scientific math problem into a sensory experience. Yeah. And that sensory experience is then trying to morph that that skill of hitting the ball into playing a shot. And the the first prerequisite of playing a shot is knowing how far the ball is going to go. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we we like to put <laughs> we like to put together a matrix where there's, you know, we can't all just hit full shots with each club. So you have to create partials and those partials are created by calling different lengths of swings, different things based on percentages of energy or body parts or um, whatever you want to call it. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, whatever calls up that number. And then once you've hit X amount of numbers and you've done maybe what we would call a matrix test and you have some tolerances based on how good that player is, whether they should be within one or two or three yards of the carry number and obviously there's great pieces of equipment out there now that we have access to like a cg quad that that kind of measures that carry distance be it in a dome so yeah. it's very easy to kind of create that and then obviously we've got a facility at grove where we can set out these targets that are or most of them that we use with these guys are all world number one so if they're gonna hit the number and it's between and it lands on this target, we know that the proximity is right as well. So yeah. you start off with working on mechanics and then you move it into distance control and then you line up balls at different lengths of yardages and then you hit them to this target that's maybe between 125 and 150 away and then out of 21 balls, 11 should go on that terrace. And then that's a good practice session. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I would expect, or well, maybe I'm wrong, um, that part of this... Once the, the technique is there, once it becomes the, the skill of hitting the ball the correct distance through the correct window trajectory wise, I'm, I'm sure there's shot shaping involved with this too, because I'd have to think there'd be some bleed over between, you know, if you turning the thing from right to left too much, you asking X professional to just cut one into the target a little bit, just to, to neutralize, to use your term, the technique some, right? Yeah, there's, yeah, especially, and it's interesting because um where grove is it's, it's a very wind sensitive site where it's pretty okay. open so it's it's pretty windy it can get very windy and it was we've learned so much from wind conditions <laughs> and it's we've learned so much of what the wind does to the ball mark especially yeah. especially crosswinds and when we know how far something is specifically away and we know how much landing area we've got because we've built it a certain way out there. Mm -hmm. um, if the ball crosses the wrong side of the flag, how much further it goes. So to yeah. keep it online and hit a hold, how much more club you need to hit and how much, how much bravery you need to hit it that hard mm -hmm. and to make it go that distance because you're using way more club than you would do if you're hitting a hold into wind off the right and to, to take some of the curve out. And my goal would be to, especially at the highest level would be to keep the curvature of the ball inside the proximity that you're trying to hit the ball into. So, so you never get outside of the goalposts, if you will. Right? Yeah. So okay. if you've got, if you're, if you're working with someone that from 125 to 150, 150, their target proximity is 18 feet. Mm -hmm. You would want to kind of set your target, the flag at one side of the green and put another flag 18 feet right of that and try and keep the curvature of the ball inside that goal. Okay. And if the wind's off the right, that requires a hold, obviously. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing about the nice thing about that is you're controlling the amount of curve that you're putting on the ball as well. But you're doing it visually and, and within feel. So again, you're playing shots under a sensory experience rather than just doing it on a track man and just totally going by numbers. Oh, you know what? I'm going to go after my strokes gain buddies who throw these strokes gain metrics at me every single time when they're trying to justify how a person's played. You know, you, you talk about what you're doing and you're hitting the shot into this. And first off, just the lay golfer listening to this, these are elite golfers and we're learning to practice like a pro. So you're hitting a certain shape. You're realizing the influence of the wind. You're not just bashing balls away and wondering why it's not going like it should. Yeah. And then you add to the insult to the injury, some on the golf course, 
you might have the wind out of the right, flags on the right, water's left, and you've got the ball above your feet. Yeah. Uh, not all 125-yard shots are the same, huh? <laughs> right, uh, for sure. There's there's no doubt about it. Again, that, that so then it, it kind of lends itself to what you originally started this with, which is the, the quote that you came out with earlier is from Michael, you have to make the training harder than the playing. Yeah. And that's my goal. And and the guys have been really good, the guys that work on it out there. And and honestly, and this is kind of a unique statement to make about a practice facility, Mark. There's more failure that goes on out there than success. Oh, so true. So yeah. so it's how you then frame that failure. And and if you ask Michael that you you've got to fail in training. You just have to fail in training. And failure is where the biggest areas of improvement are. Yeah. Okay. So we <laughs> This is what happens in my conversations. They're not interviews. We've talked about motor pattern training and we've gone into yeah. distance control or the open space stuff. Yep. And we haven't got to the full space, the, the, the full the process. process is, yeah, the full process is the target acquisition, which is the proximity work. Mm. I, I, I want you to advise golfers here too, because the one thing when they're watching golfers on TV, and I'm trying to tell people all the time, because when I work for CBS, I've got the penultimate group on Saturday and Sunday. And these folks play yeah. the world. And Dotty Pepper is the final group, and these folks are playing well. And even these folks will lay off certain shots. They don't just go after everything. So I want you to tell, inform the listener some in this process training and in this training and practicing for success that they're just certain shots that even with all the work in the world, you shouldn't go having a cut at when you're out there playing for a score. Oh, I agree. I, I think there's two, there's two parts to answer there first of all i think that i think that you've got to be aware of what your actual skill level is mm -hmm. and i don't think certainly club golfers kind of realize what their skill level actually is and so they don't really necessarily know where they should be aiming mm -hmm. um they very rarely aim away from a flag and if they do it's six feet from 200 yards and we both know that that's not that's not realistic so that's the first thing is is that you've got to be aware of what your skill level actually is and 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 then how does it feel what do you what's your emotional intelligence while you're over the ball when you aim at a target that's too close to the flag does it make you feel nervous and if it does then you need to look in another place until you feel like you can achieve something so um it's always nice to feel confident over a shot and so i would feel i would select a target that you know that you can execute rather than one that you hope that you execute and yeah. that's that's more of a confidence thing so confidence is knowing you can do something rather than hoping so pick a target that you know that you can execute rather than hope you can okay i've got various questions bouncing around in my head and i'm going to try and get these out <laughs> one at a time first off um you talked about the matrix when you're building the distance control because i don't think that the everyday club golfer the weekend warrior listening to this because they just think don't hit it left and right bad but long yeah. and short is equally as bad and yeah the better you get the more important that is the, the matrix you talk about the distance control and you talked about the pros having the certain variance in terms of distance yeah um, when a player is building this grid would you advise the player to say okay they come and see you and they're like okay we've worked the thing now and now we're going to go seven eight nine iron wedge or you can hit them one by one, or do you hit a few at a time? Ad advise the folks to the ratio of the practice, if you understand what I'm trying to say. So I think the how we've done it in the past is, is that you select a wedge, be it a 58 or a 54 or 55, like a, a lob wedge or a sandwich that you start the process with. And you want, obviously, a numerous amount of numbers with that, because those are where... 10, ten more? You ten want, ten. Yeah, you want as many as you possibly can. Right. And when you've got your favorite one, and it might be let's say let's say with a 55 degree wedge it might be 80 yards and we're just talking like a somewhat of a partial with most people with a 55 degree wedge um if you then do that with your gap wedge how far does that go and yeah. if you then do that with your pitching wedge how far does that go and how far with the nine iron does it go and then you start kind of bleeding it out from there so and and i would start certainly with any kind of club golfer Let's just start with five to six yards. If you can do one with five yard differences, that's amazing. That's really that good. That really man. is. That's really great. That really is. Well, five yards. And is then a, that's only fifteen feet, unless my arithmetic's failing me. Yeah. It is. It is fifteen feet. Yeah, it is. It's doable for sure. Trust me, it really is doable. But it, it requires it requires some training. It requires some repetition, and 
the nice thing about that is is that it 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 puts the gaze of focus somewhere else rather than the repetitions just being purely hitting balls mechanically to then doing something that's based on honestly something that's going to actually genuinely affect your score yeah. rather than something that we don't really know whether there's any evidence to suggest that just because you swing it better you're going to score better okay listen i've been involved <laughs> with countless professional golfers at the elite <laughs> level and their swings have looked so much greater and i've felt like a million dollars and then the score's not any better doesn't we've matter. all been in that we've all we've all suffered that much no, it doesn't work and what i love too about what you're talking about there darren is you know there's a big movement to skill acquisition you know, yeah you the golfer in the old days you used to get your grip fixed and get your alignment fixed and your ball position and off you go and you make sure you don't come over the top or whatever but nowadays there's the skill of learning to curve the ball and and where you put the landing spot of the swing down and and what's the angle of attack and this sort of deal so what you're saying there it brings the skill of the shot making into it as well. Yeah, it's, I mean, certainly down here in Florida, one of the big skill acquisitions that we've be, got really good at is judging wind. Yeah. And what it's actually playing because it's, um, I mean, so let's say that you've got 10 miles an hour of wind, that's going to play 15 yards more flighted by someone that can really hit it. So flighted means that you're hitting the, on a lot. Into the wind, right? Yeah, so, I mean, 10 miles an hour into, that's 15 yards. That's one and a half times more. That's 15 yards of hurt, and that's on a trajectory that's 10 yards lower in trajectory with a spin rate spin rate that's 500 less. So, it's, and, it's a, poor, and, that, and, the, and that's to someone that can really hit it. So, I was about let alone doing it to everyone else's ball. I, I'm losing my mind. And, and then the, I've got to say this, listener, club golfer, then you got 10 yards of wind in, as Darren illustrates here, and you it's causing you 15 yards of hurt, yet you leaning on that ATAR and trying to hit the yeah. same way, and the thing just stands up and plugs in a bunker yeah. and the whole day yeah. room. Yeah, and you blame it on yourself, and um, it's it's not you. I, it's, yeah. some, it's the wind. Okay, so that's the hurt. I, I think most folks look for too much help. Because you see a lot of folks, they don't keep the ball in the air enough. And with a modern golf ball, which spins a little less, it just gets yeah. squatted down by, by a tailwind. Yeah, they don't spin it enough to keep it in the trajectory. Yeah, so it, it comes down too quickly. So it definitely gets knocked out for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. All right. So judging wind. Um, so the full process and one of your three elements, again, the motor pattern training, the yep. open space training for the proximity, which I think is awesome. Yeah. Um, and then the full process is this where you're working with a professional whoever and you've picked this uh, pick the shot go through the entire on course routine is this what yeah. you're talking about club in the bag club yeah. out the bag, that sort of thing yeah so again so you've got mpt is working on mechanics open space is working on distance distance control only mm -hmm. and then full process is doing the proximity work and actually hitting to a target that involves okay, a flag right. okay got you so so that uh, that then does um, that does include also full routine. So you'd step up to, um, again, we line the balls up at three to five yard increments, depending on how good that player is. It's lined up at a target out in the approach shot area. And you walk up to a shot and you laser it and you say, how far is it? That's the first question. And the next question is, where do you want to land it? And that that, that is a landing number, which most amateurs don't say. No. They they just, I'm going to land it next to the flag. or um, And then it's... Um, so how far is it? Where do you want to land it? What is that playing is the next question. So you get them used to coming up with a playing number rather than just an actual number. And then you would ask them, what shot is that off the matrix? And if they haven't got a matrix, obviously, they're then just guessing. So what you're trying to do is train all the tools that they need to then execute full process the best that they can. And the full process training is pretty much just getting closer to the actual event, which is hitting a shot on the golf course. I have to say this because I, I'm sure for the golfer listening to this, they're like, oh, Lord, this sounds impossible. This sounds like Greek now. But the truth of it all is, once you're into the habit of, and, and I'll just say, okay, laser, you've looked at the lie first off. You laser the target. Wind hurt five yards. So now that number's jumped by five. And I want to land it a bit short because anything long is dangerous. So I've went from 150 to 155, and I want to carry this thing 145-ish. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it 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 comes simpler than what it's sounding. I guess is what I'm wanting you to tell folks. Yeah, it it is. It's just gonna. So 
they kind of do this on the golf course, right? They, they've got this kind of way of approaching a shot on the golf course, but they don't practice that. They don't train mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And they expect the, they go onto an area that's called the range and they hit balls and that's practice training is training what you want to do to play so yeah. it's it's like an eastern philosophy quote mark where practice is practicing the skill required to um defend yourself so skill acquisition is doing it in front of someone that's punching you back quite frankly so mm-hmm. that that's what you're doing is is that you're practicing learning to hit the ball and then you're training you're training you're training to hit shots so just just be aware that there's got to be a part of your time on the range where you're done only focusing on how to hit the ball and then give yourself the opportunity every now and again to laser a couple of flags and go through that mental dialogue or that internal dialogue of saying to yourself okay how far is that it's 157 where do I want to land that I want to land that I'm going to land that four four short I'm going to land that 143 what's that 153 what's that playing Mm -hmm. Uh, it's playing 10 more than that that's 163 oh that's going to be a that's going to be a three-quarter six sign for me yeah and it's not a sin to go to a club that you don't normally hit on the golf course that that is not a a show of loss of you know strength or whatever it just might be the environment yeah for sure yeah yeah it's just looking at it a little differently that's all and it's a great way to look at it it's how the professionals look at it which i was why yeah um Let's talk about, let's say we've done this. Oh, we, we've, we've, we've went through it. We've gone through our numbers. We, we, we trained. We've hit the shot. It didn't work out. Yep. You know, if it works out, great. You know, then you're feeling good about yourself, but you didn't pull the shot off. In yep. Fact, yep. What do you do then? Do you go back and hit the same shot or do you try and do something else? What would you advocate? So the, there's, two ways of, there's two ways of judging it, obviously. The first way of judging it is, is that... Um, did we get it wrong because of the conditions and did we not play at the right number? So it could be that we just didn't judge the win correctly, or we just made a mistake with the playing number. If does that make, does that make yeah, sense? Of course, yeah. The other one, the other one is, um, and this is where, this is where there's an important part to this that we haven't really touched on, but I feel it's like a, it's, it's probably the most important part of this. Um, you've got to just move on to the next one because that has gone and this is about training in the moment and and being present for each one and there's nothing that you can do about the one that you've just done you can only just let that go and move on to the next one and go through the process exactly the same and no one really practices that or trains that either Mm -hmm. and the other part about that mark is is that if it doesn't work out and you've missed your target that's what chipping's for (laughs) i know it sounds i know it sounds crazy but it just is it's the common denominator in golf is that every shot has a shot that's going to come after that that's going to define the value of the shot that you just hit yeah uh, for sure. i got a good friend brady riggs he calls the bad shot the result of it an ote or an opportunity to excel yeah where most folks on the range, they're wrecking the ball back and then they're trying to just, eventually they're grinding so hard, they've gotten out of the professional practice and training and they're wearing themselves out, which brings me to fatigue. What sort of, what sort of time would you advocate for just your average golfer listening to this? Because obviously the pros go long and hard. With breaks in between, what would you advise time-wise? Um. I think it's I think it's difficult to attach a time on it. I mean, people's time now is obviously very valuable, and it's it's mm-hmm. spending that much time doing this kind of stuff is has a price, obviously. Um, but if you're going to invest a certain amount of time, I like the idea of however long it's going to take for you to achieve your goals. So, for example, if you've got a goal of your mechanics and you know what you're working on with your coach or your instructor, if you feel you're doing what you need to be doing or you're using something that's showing you that you're doing within reason what you're doing don't prolong moving on to the next area of progress so it might take you 12 balls to execute what you want to do mechanically and then go and hit a few yardages and if you hit your numbers where they need to be then move on to proximity work or hitting shots with full process routine i don't think that you want to put say okay i'm gonna 
if I've got two hours, I'm going to spend an hour doing my mechanics. I'm going to do half an hour doing this. And then I think that kind of the time side of it, I don't think is a, is a reasonable way of governing the performance of, of how long you should be spending doing it. I'd rather it be um, rep based as in, okay, let's give yourself 25 balls to do mechanics. Okay. What I like about that is, is that just putting 25 balls in front of you and you're only allowed 25 balls to work on your swing, that that puts a little bit of a mental load on that in itself. Yeah, it revs the focus a little bit. I it does rev the focus. Yeah, yeah for sure. That's what, that's what I did want to say because like if you're working, uh, you see so many golfers now in the summertime. I'm in Georgia, you're in Florida, it's cooking. You know, yeah. you get a few balls, you're tired, you aren't bothered, it's not going well. And then the next thing is just a slog and nothing's being achieved. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, having that boundary, if you will, that'll just keep you in the moment and make that stuff more productive. That's the, that's the key is, are you achieving a mindset of being somewhat present while you're doing this? Yeah. It's going to require that. And, you know, I'm, I'm open to say that this, what, what we do and what I do and what I've learned from Michael with this, the interesting thing with this, Mark, is that there's so many parallels from the unique conversations and the time that I've had with Michael. This is how Michael did it. Uh, it was just in basketball and so he'd go to be, technique and then he'd have situational deal. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. It would be, there wouldn't be anything that he would do that, that didn't have a mindset associated with it. And there wasn't a mental load attached to it. So Michael would work in sevens. So he knew that if he got seven in a row or did seven reps the same, and it felt the same way, he knew that he knew that, that he could move on to the next stage of progression. Um, and the, the, the really cool thing about it is, is that I asked him not that long ago, actually, was there ever a time that you went through your seven reps and didn't realize that it was the seventh one? And he said, he said, yeah, multiple times. So I can't tell you how impressive that is to be in the moment and not realize that if seven's your number and you've gone through it seven times, um, and you didn't realize that's as in the moment as you can possibly be because you just don't realize that you've come to the end of it. Now, the beauty of this is going to sound like a trite question, but I must ask it. Whether this is long game or short game, bunker shots, pitch shots, long putts, short putts, whatever, same training regimen applies? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> same, same okay. mindset to it, yeah. Yeah, same mindset to it, yeah. Awesome. Uh, just one more question and I'm, I'm so thankful for your time the practice to me i think is a lot of folks waste the time you've shared ideas where folks can make the time really count but is there do you recommend or do your pros or do you see this happen where afterwards if the work's been done and it was one of those days where it's all clicked is there an element of note taking or something like that, or or just summarizing and, and revisiting the fields and stuff, and letting that stuff sort of become part of one's being, if you will? So, um, yeah, the answer to that's yeah, but it, it depends on the training side of it. So, I'll give you I'll give you an example. Um, you know the rings that we use to show proximity for chipping and pitching, the yeah. wire rings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're doing it, if you're doing it fully engaged in a 10 to 20 yard chipping pitching test and the balls are put out certain distances and you're doing it randomly, which means that you hit the one that's 10 yards away and then you walk back and hit the one that's 19 yards away. And then you, you basically change it up all the way through and you're fully engaged in picking your, in picking your landing area and going through your routine and doing it as if you were doing it on the golf course. And if you have 12 balls there and the, and the circle, because we can change the circle sizes. Yeah. And if the circle size is appropriate for your skill level, eight out of 12 need to go into that circle. So there's a goal that there's a goal number that needs to go in there. Which again, if you're doing, like, if, that's the focus, if you, it puts the pressure it, on it. Absolutely. Yeah. It puts the pressure on it. It achieves the focus. Mm -hmm. If, if you do it that way and you can sustain that level of concentration, when you go out and play, there will be glimpses of that circle on the green, even though it's not there. I get you. So, so it's, so it's almost like the work has been intense is not the right word. Um, it's a different, it's a, yeah, it's a different, it's a different attention hmm. and it's a different your mind's, eye, your mind's eyes has got it. It's different. Yeah. yeah, it's different. So 
the other way of explaining that is, is that if you just threw that ring out on the green and just threw balls down and pitched to it, you would never see it when you went out and played. Huh. <laughs> you know what? I, I'm, I'm sort of somewhat guilty of that, too, because I've given lessons where you talk about landing spot, trajectory, release, understanding that sort of stuff. And the folks hit a few in there and it's you're right. It, it's not that like I'm into this thing. It's yeah, I'm, I'm just basically autopiloting away here and I get a few in. And, and you can use it. You can use it for autopilot. That's fine. Don't get me wrong. I do as well. And there's definitely times where I'll just throw it out there and it'll be something for us to do distance control with. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to do it, if you're going to do it under the conditions that you want to try and nurture when they go out and play, you want to, first of all, apply a little bit of a mental load based on how many balls need to go in there line the balls up at specific distances away from the hole based on maybe where they're deficient yardage wise and then make them do it randomly. So they can't hit two balls from the same spot. They have to move around a good amount because, you know, we want them to get used to judging distance based on doing one at one yardage and then one at the other. And then once they're in that mindset and, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to, they're going to see a big difference in what that, how they execute then on the golf course um that's what we found anyway okay it's been fantastic uh, to sort of put a bow on this i, I want to just throw a few things at you and i want you to tell me if i've missed it so 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 obviously the technique you iron that stuff out then you're good to go then you work off different lies certainly different yardages you focus on your proximity then you get into the full process of the whole thing uh, uh, have i summarized the conversation enough for the listener of slash viewer over here yeah I, yeah i yeah i think that again that we've kind of started this there's there's two elements to this there's the, the skill of hitting the ball and the yeah the then learning the skill of playing a shot and considering that you're going to go out in the golf course and hopefully play shots i mean we all hear people say you know he's just playing golf swing out there mm -hmm. and we know that happens on on the pga tour yeah. and and that's all very well but then how are you going to train someone to move out of golf swing and start again, turning a math problem into a sensory experience. And I'm trying to stimulate that as much as possible by using distance control and proximities and shapes of shots and lies and, and, and multiple different challenges like that, that, you know, have a mental load position with them. So it kind of stimulates a, a different kind of mindset. And then, you know, you're training the mindset to go along with that, which is, how to be present during that and you want to be present playing in a tournament so why wouldn't you train that when you're practicing or training amen, amen brother okay uh before i ask you to share where folks can find you i want to throw your name and uh, and see if you have a counter or if you agree what you were describing there from the work on the range to the out there playing the game not playing golf swing yeah justin thomas currently in 2022 yes do you agree with my observation well I'm it's sure that Justin would be okay with this, but, but we've been working with Justin's practice since January. So that's been, yeah. that's been awesome. Well, look, I, I see the guy when he's out there, he's got like one little move practice swing wise where it's just a refresher, but he's not, he's not grinding. Yeah. And the rest of the time he's changing speeds. He's on the swing. He's changing trajectory. It's shot at shape changing. Uh, I mean, the touch around the greens, you can see there's variation on every single one. I know not every shot is the same, but he doesn't approach, approach every shot the same either. It might be no. a shot from green side. Yeah, he's, he's uh, first of all, obviously, he's a very unique individual. First of all, he's incredibly driven. I mean, he's incredibly driven. Um, he's, he's obviously very, very, very talented, but it's interesting how guys, it's interesting how guys get to their number as in distance control differently. So. Um, some guys actually respond, if you say a number first, um, you want them to hit it 145, um, they kind of go, okay, I need to hit it 145, that's this thing, this thing on my matrix, that's how they kind of come up with it. Right. Um, someone like JT sees trajectory and window the first, and then gets to the number after that. I can see that. And that's why he's, folks, for those of you that haven't watched Justin Thomas play, He'll hit any number of clubs that same distance for you, which yeah. amateur golfer doesn't. And it drives me bananas because they've got to learn the skill of that feel, man. It's amazing how great a skill that is to hit to hit uh, three balls 140 yards with three different clubs. It's, mm -hmm. it's an amazing skill.
so hard no one wants to try it because it's difficult to do that's great skill to no have. one likes doing no one likes doing anything that's difficult and no one likes to fail but that's where the improvement is mark you've just circled back to where we began this thing you're such a pro <laughs> okay darren may please share for the folks where they can find you website social media if they like honestly i don't i don't really do any of that um, this podcast is the only place right <laughs> this is the only place yeah this is the only place Oh, you're the best. I uh, appreciate you. I appreciate everything you're doing. I appreciate your time coming on here. Um, it's great stuff. And I'm sure all the folks really, really gathered a lot from your insights. Thank you. Sure. Anytime. Happy to do it. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>